Hi, this is Daniela Kambonen. Welcome back to the Daniela Kambonen Show here on ITM Trading in our studio in New York City, joined today by David Dalio. He's the former CIO and board member over at BNY Mellon. He ran one of the largest small and mid-cap equity uh, franchises in the country. And now you invest for yourself looking especially for plays that others might be ignoring. David, so good to be back with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in studio with yes, you. Yes, in person. It was a year ago that we met at a conference that is replaying uh, this year. So. Our mutual friend, Joel Lippmann, yes, exactly uh, who yep. was on earlier uh, today, who uh, might be a, a convert now embracing this gold trade, at I, I, kind of like yourself, because about yeah. a year ago, you kind of jumped, you said, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm liking gold, right? And you weren't a natural gold investor, am I wrong? You know, by no means. And, you know, first back up into my career, um, I spent 25, 30 years looking at cash flows and understanding that I'm discounting securities. And we had the choice of investing in gold miners, not as much spot gold, but gold miners. And they, they never jumped out to me as different or interesting. And we looked for three conditions that I think are now all present in gold. The first is you, you always want price on your side and you want some element of disbelief. Clearly, um, you know, I was joking with you, Daniela, we'll know that you've made it to the superstar <laughs> fame when, when Larry, Larry Fink, Fink asked for you yeah. on the show. And so we're not there yet, right? right? And the, the, the other element um, is I always look for something on the macro that was pushing things in your way, right? So then you knew that the trend was longer than it would have been all is equal. So I think all that is in spades for, for gold for the first time in my 25 or 30 year career. Wow. Okay, so two things that jump, uh, you know, uh, that I want to ask you is one, uh, why do you think Wall Street was ignoring that rally? Because, you know, the day that gold broke through 2600, you know, I'm looking on the front page of Bloomberg, CNBC, no mention of mm. this gold rally. Why is there, why is Wall Street still not embracing the gold trade here? Gold is inconvenient for the popular narrative. So the, the popular narrative is the economy is stable and rising. Uh, the popular na narrative is the Fed has things in control. Right, right, um, right. And the popular narrative, at least from the key advertisers, is that you buy internet-related stocks or NVIDIA-related stocks to make money, ETFs, what have you. Um, so I think it is the most overlooked straight up asset I have ever seen. Wow. So gold since the Ukraine war yeah. has spot gold has outperformed the S and P five hundred, which is one of the best performing assets since the Ukraine war built out. So I am really shocked. I'm really shocked. And talking about that narrative that the Fed wants you to believe and you know and, and in terms of this gold rally, a lot of people say, well it's because the Fed started started, you know, cutting, right? Mm -hmm. Um but your from what you're saying, this gold rally, is it tied to what the Fed is doing or there's so much more at play? I, I think there's so many things at play on gold. So let's let's think about from the broader construct. Um, the, the, the first thing is that the Bretton Woods II era was a simple era. It started in the Nixon regime and you know, we ran out of money, frankly. And so we said, look, we don't want to have as many. We want to be able to print more dollars than we had gold. Nixon said, this is great. We can spend more than we have. It was also a detente with our trading partners that said, if you buy our treasuries, yeah. we'll buy your plastic toys, mattresses, semiconductors, what have you. That was the deal with China, Mexico, et cetera. And so we've been running large deficits in this country um, with virtually no consequences. Exactly. And, and now it looks to me that we're closer to having those consequences whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, both of them are pushing for large fiscal increases, regardless of the economic state. That's very unusual. So I think that's it. The, the second thing is, in the Fed's defense, the, the first day you announced QE, which I believe was after LCCM blew up in 1998, right, where they artificially lowered interest rates to save off a crisis, cut rates by 200. Then we did it again in 01, in a recession. Then we did it again in 08, another 200. And then we did it again post-COVID, and we got real rates to minus 200. So the number below minus 200 really doesn't exist right. for rates. And so I, I think the Fed's hands are a little tied here. And I'm worried that 
we have entered a period of higher and higher inflation, and we have all the secular pressures for that. And so while the Fed thinks that inflation is under control, I don't think we'll see that in nine months' time. So if you've got an aggressive Fed with inflation moderating up, there you're in a stagflationary economy, and I'm not rooting for that. Okay, because it also brings, you know, brings up the question of, well, what does the Fed, maybe they do know that the inflation is, is going to be out of control, uh, because why would they have done that, that cut, David? I mean, what's yeah. brewing underneath? I mean, is it, no, oh, is it just the softening of the labor market that they're concerned about? It has to be more, maybe? I, when, when I went through um, what Jay Powell said, yeah. it looked to me like he was claiming victory. Right. I, I, I crushed the I little inflation right, bill in. Right. We're not going to, like, yeah. it was the weirdest presser right. I've ever seen. Like, I'm going to get that soft line. So yeah. it, that is unusual for Fed governors. So I went back and listened to congressional testimony from Bernanke, January nice. of 08. Nice. Okay. Okay. So January of 08, the economy's doing fine, yeah. but this mortgage thing is starting to crumble. Yeah. He doesn't say, I figured it out. I know how to save this thing. We've got a, you know, perfect U-shaped recovery going on. He said... Guess what? We're in trouble here, and I can see financial distress over the next year as the mortgage market crumbles. That's what I expected to hear from our central bankers, because similar in 1998 or in 2008, we have leading economic indicators softening. Bernanke didn't know any more than that then. He could just see it. Powell sees exactly the same thing. Is it ego at play then? Mm. I mean, you what? know, I've been I've been DM. You know, Jay Powell all the time. He doesn't yeah. respond to my calls, okay. so I don't know yet. Right. I, I, here's here's what I can here's what I can speculate um, is that he's really in a he's really in a box. So no matter who right. is in charge here, w when you've manipulated rates this long, yeah. look at Japan and the problems we're having with the yen dollar relationship. It just becomes harder and harder. And so that balance beam that he's on, when inflation volatility picks up, that balance beam is about an inch wide. And an inch wide balance sheet, it's easy to make a mistake. So I think that's where he is. It, you know, is there is there ego involved? I think there's an attempt to claim a victory lap. That's not what we need our central bankers to do. They need to be seen but not heard. Talk to me about why you think we could be seeing a Bretton Woods moment sooner than later. Um, you know, history's bound to repeat. I, I, I think... What, what Bretton Woods 2 was about was the world, we didn't have computers, right? We, we had been through very volatile currency periods because of the war and what have you. So the world was looking for a central clearing device. Mm -hmm. So Nixon and his team raised their hand and said, you know, the United States would love to be that. We'll take all currencies, cross them with you, but we're going to have everything hedged hedge against the dollar. And, and then he said, and what, we're going to sell you all of our bonds. We're going to buy, eventually buy your toys and what have you. Um, where we are today is our largest trading partner is quickly becoming our enemy. Right. And then th this is, uh, this is going to sound cynical, but um, we, we reclaimed, when the Ukraine war started, $600 billion from Russian citizens. Not from Russia, but from Russian citizens. That's $3,000 per capita, so it's real money. We seized that. What you did is you, for the first time, you weaponized the U.S. currency. We've never done that before. We've entered a dozen wars, and we never weaponized our currency. That is the day that gold started going up, and it hasn't had, really hasn't had a down month since. So I think that was the beginning yes. of central banks yeah. around the world being worried about the Bretton II was era, which was all about the dollar. And they started buying gold 100%. at record amounts. So now 100%. what's the next step, David? How does this what's how does this unfold? Is it a BRICS narrative for you? Mm -hmm. Um how do you see this playing out? Yeah, so I have the advantage of not being in a swim lane. And so I'm speaking for Dave Daglio okay. on how Dave Daglio yeah. would invest. No one should invest the way I do. But what what I see in the world is you want to be out of dollar-based assets. I think it's almost a given that the dollar is very expensive on a purchase power parity basis. You know, a cup of coffee in Tokyo is two dollars. A cup of coffee in Boston is six. It used to be the inverse of that, right? So, so there's a lot of room, you know, necessarily for that to come. I, I think that's the biggest takeaway. 
I don't know how the Cold War between the U.S. and China ends. What I see, though, is the making of a war because no one likes the Chinese in the United States. You can see it polling Republican and Democrats very well. So that, that's kind of where I go. And you mentioned uh, the debt before, right? Mm -hmm. The $35 trillion. And yeah. our good friend Joel Littman will argue and say he doesn't think yeah. that it's a crisis yet. He's not worried and not losing yeah. sleep over the debt. From what I'm hearing from you, it, it is a serious problem. So I want to see yeah. how do we service this debt? How does this, you know, are we going to just increase uh, spending and, you know, mm -hmm. shut, sorry, increase taxation, shut the valves on spending? Or are we going to default on the debt or, yeah. or, 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 I mean, a democratic system, a populist system, a voting-based system where you have elections every two, four, and six years, um, it, it's assured that you will spend more than you have. That's a given. So it's going, it's, yeah. it's, a politician isn't going to step in and stop spending money. It, look, it, Republicans and Democrats, I said earlier, are spending. Where it's going to come is what happened in the United Kingdom 18 months ago. If you remember, they had a very yes. populist yes. agenda. And the currency went berserk, as did interest rates. I think where we'll see the leakage in the United States is in the 10 to 30 year stretch. Mm -hmm. If we see that steepen, that's a signal that people do not want to have our debt for long periods of time. And that would be the biggest risk. Um, and it's the one part of the market, if I was a central banker and I was going to let it run, meaning I don't want it to run, right. I would let 10 to 30s go. So, in, so that steepness of the yield curve, to me, is a signal that the central banks have lost control of the narrative, at least on that portion of the curve. I, I'm not giving up. I'm, I agree with Joel. The central banks can control the two to five. I do not believe that people will give them the right to control the 30-year, because we don't know what's going to happen 30 years later with the fiscal deficit in the United States. So wrapping this all up, because you know, I even mentioned this to Joel, you know, so many of our viewers tune in because they're really uncertain and feel scared for mm -hmm. for the future here uh, David I mean how do you how do you see things playing out in the next five years or just some words of wisdom here um, I, I, I always think about things relative to business cycles and optimism pessimism and where you want to invest is where the fundamentals are long-term sound but there's some element of pessimism and the inverse of that obviously you don't want to invest where there's optimism you know simply you don't want to be in restaurants with long lines so so with that, so with that said, um, I, I think we need to be prepared for a business cycle slowdown in the next eighteen months. And what that means to me is you need to be more cautious than you normally would. The reason I believe we have a business cycle slowdown, contrary to what Powell, and Powell said, we're going to have this beautiful soft landing. Yeah. Is soft landings are total storybook endings. They seldom happen. Second, business cycles don't end of old age. They end of excessive optimism. We have so much optimism that the Federal Reserve can That's control true. it. Yep. You remember in, in 2008, we weren't friends then. In 2008, the universal belief was, it's okay, we're going to have a housing crisis in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. but it could never spill over into California because you don't have a nationwide housing crisis. Right. Now it is, hey, the central banks can control interest rates to a level that we wouldn't have a recession. I don't think that's true for a second. So I worry about the economic story. Yeah. So be cautious. Be cautious. Stay cautious. So... You know, shorter duration bonds, I think you want to be out of assets that look like the traditional 60-40, which is, by the way, what Wall Street is selling you. And, and you really want to think about things that are uncorrelated. We're, I, I just did a, a seminal paper um, and work that, uh, you know, frankly, I've been working on for about five years, which is where should you invest inside of commodities? And, and gold's in the top of the list. Next will be uranium and then natural. You like uranium? I do. I do. Yeah. Can we talk about it? Yeah, a little bit. I'm just curious because uh, I mean, you know, it's one of those. I mean, look, the, opaque market. this one, yeah. it is an opaque market. Right. Like, let's keep it really simple. Yeah, we we have not produced enough uranium since 1967 for the amount of demand there is for yeah. uranium today. Okay, and that's because we built up stockpiles yeah. in the 60s that we're still working our way down. Right. So we need more production. Second, you've all seen the announcements. Everyone has seen yes. the announcement on TV. We saw. Microsoft building yes. a major power plant. We yes. see the Indies and India and China yeah. building yeah. SMRs at rapid rates. Yeah. It looks like it works. Um, and it probably is our only um, olive branch between 
those that want power uh -huh. and those that need the environment clean. It looks to be like the middle ground to me. So I really, I really like it. I mean, there's only one stock really, which is Cameco. Right. It, it, it's well run. It has pulled in a little bit, so that's a place I might consider. All right, Dave Dalio, thank you so much. Yeah. Come back soon. Great. And see uh, we'll see you soon. And thank you all for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way. So. Be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni show here on ITM Trading. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and sign up at DanielaCamboni.com to stay on top of it all. Thanks for watching.